Thank you very much for the warm introduction. Uh, I must say that I'm totally excited to be here. In fact, I'm so excited that half my brain runs to run away. Luckily, the other half is in control. And this is what I want to tell you about today. I want to talk about control, about the fact that your brains are capable of doing things that you cannot even imagine. Also, I'll try to convince you that when it comes to humans and machines, the humans are the ones who should be in control. So imagine there is a world where you could control various devices with your brain. For example, you could play a game without using your hands, without using your legs, without talking. You could, for example, move objects in the room like you were some kind of Jedi. I mean, some kind of Jedi. It doesn't work on you, does it? So it doesn't work, but what we could do is to build something else, something that is called a brain-machine interface or brain-computer interface, or BCI for short. So these devices, what they basically do, they collect the activity of your brain they read your mind in some way, and they transfer it to an interface that then executes actions in the world. For example, moving a robotic arm, or moving a cursor on the screen, or in case of a paralyzed patient, moving a, a wheelchair forward, right? So this is what a BCI is. Now, today, we are still in the infancy of these technologies. We have two major classes of technologies. The first one are the so-called invasive techniques. Something that you see on the left, is an invasive technique that actually uh, supposes introducing in the brain small electrodes or microelectrodes that have golden contacts. And these are very, very tiny, smaller than a, than a hair. And each such contact is listening to the electrical activity of neurons in your brain. The great advantage that you have here is that you can read out very high density information. You can hear independent cells in your brain firing action potentials, electrical impulses. But there are two major disadvantages. One of them is that you can only look in a very localized region. You cannot open the whole brain and introduce billions of wires into the brain. You would kill it, right? Second, this technique is invasive. So you would need to drill a hole in your skull and then introduce some wires through the, through the hole. So how many of you are willing or would accept to have their skulls drilled? Please raise your hands. Not so many, as I was thinking. Luckily, we have another class of techniques, which are called non-invasive techniques, something that you see on the right, and where the idea is that you could read out this electrical activity of the brain without actually opening the skull, looking from outside. And this technique is called electroencephalography, or EEG. And the very happy guy there is me <laughs> and my colleagues in uh, putting an EEG cap on my head. So what this cap is, uh, is basically just a cap that has some holes in which you introduce electroconductive gel. And this gel conducts electricity that is captured from the electric fields that your neurons are generating when talking to each other. Now you take all these electric fields, you amplify them, and that what you get are signals that typically look like this. What you see here is also the brain activity from my brain. And there is a green line, vertical line, and that's the point where I closed my eyes. This is visual cortex. What happens in visual cortex when you close your eyes is that you get this very nice oscillation, which is called the alpha oscillation. It was discovered in 1924 by Hans Berger, an Austrian uh, physician, and it was the first oscillation that was discovered. This is why it's called alpha. The next ones were called beta, gamma, and so on. More importantly, what happens in the brain is that as we are active or inactive, these oscillations can be slower, just like a computer clock. When you're sleeping or drowsy, you have slow oscillations. When you are very alert, awake, you're doing stuff, you're thinking, you're meditating, you get fast oscillations. Even in these traces, you can see that there are some very tiny potentials of high frequency. That's called the gamma oscillation. It's between 30 and 120 hertz, and it's expressed whenever we are engaged, focused, when we do motor commands and so on. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, if you have these EEG devices, can you read some mind, someone's mind out? Can, can we, will there be, whatever, AI-powered devices that will know what we're thinking? And I want to reassure you that it's not going to happen, and not anytime soon. 
And there's at least two reasons for this. The first one, we don't know where the mind is. We don't know how we think. We don't even know how we perceive the world. For example, for the past 100 years, neuroscientists could not agree how information is encoded in the brain, in the, the timing of the individual potentials, in the frequency of these potentials, in the relationship. We don't know. It's still an active debate in science. So even if we had access to the entire brain, we still wouldn't know what to do with it to read it out. Second, and this is maybe the largest limitation, is that the brain is inaccessible. You just cannot open somebody's skull and insert wires into it, right? You could use EEG, but that's very far away. And I'll explain you some of the limitations of these non-invasive techniques. So the problem with EEG is that you have to have these electric fields that are produced by the neurons that have to cross through the skull, through the bone, through the skin, and then reach your electrode. What happens is that you get two phenomena. The first one, and maybe the less uh, problematic one, is so-called volume conduction. So when these fields are crossing the barrier, they spread. And then what happens is that you get a very low resolution image. It's just like you would use a telescope to look to the planet of a different star system, and you would just see some colors, but no details. It's the same with EEG. Another problem that is much bigger is the so-called 1 over F filtering problem. All of you had, at some point, had neighbors playing loud music next door. And uh, you all know that any, what you hear is only the bass and not the treble, not the high frequencies. This is because the world is an inertial system, so high frequencies get filtered out and suppressed. This means that with EEG, you can mostly hear what is not important, the brain resting, not the active brain. So uh, how do you solve this problem? There are people in the EEG field who say, no, you cannot record gamma oscillations and fast and useful oscillations with this technique because they get filtered out by the bone. So I was talking 10 years ago with uh, one of the pioneers of brain-computer interfaces, Eberhard Fetz, who was working with monkeys and recording from single cells of monkeys controlling robotic arms. And he told me, Raul, look, nothing really works in brain-computer interfaces if you try to read out the brain. Don't try to come up with a very clever, intelligent device using AI, machine learning, you name it. It's not going to work. It's much better to use something very simple, very basic, maybe linear, and teach the brain to control it. So you should not focus on the device that reads out your, whatever, mind, but you, you should focus on the mind itself to produce activity that can reach your sensors. And this was actually the idea that we started to develop together with Vlad Moka and Harald Burzan to come up with a new technology called MindAct. And in this technology, what you try to do is to try to teach the brain to produce so strong, fast oscillations that they go through the bone, that they can reach your sensor. You basically teach your brain to talk to the device in a way that can transcend the physical barriers. And this is achieved via neurofeedback training. It's something very interesting to experience. Later on, we took this technology and we started a device for gaming, which is called Conexus, and which is just basically a set of electrodes that can be attached to any kind of uh, general pur purpose helmet. And then you would be able to control a device in a very fast manner. And this actually works. And I'm going to show you a demo about uh, my colleague Harald playing a very interactive and difficult game. So this game is about uh, controlling a spaceship such that you can collect colored boxes and avoid the gray ones. It's a game that is very difficult to play, because, even with your hands, because it renders the track using the sound of the melody you, uh, you choose. And you can choose a melody that is very entertaining, such that the game becomes faster and faster and faster. And this creates problems controlling it, especially with your hands. And you should think about the fact that the time to react in this game becomes comparable to the delay it takes for the nerve signals to go from your brain to your hand. Something very important about this technology is that you can create an independent communication channel 
that runs in parallel with your motor system. So while playing or doing something, you can still use your hands or legs or talk. This is something very difficult to achieve, but through training, your brain can do it. Impressive, right? Even, even more impressive is that Harald managed to actually have a gold and a silver medal, and these are very, very difficult to get when you play with your hands. This means that the interface can be faster than your hands. And the question is, how much faster? It's not enough to play a game to prove that the technique works. You need to measure it scientifically and objectively, and this is what we basically did. So, in principle, classical techniques that we have today, relying on the slow oscillations, on the alpha, can achieve a bandwidth, information bandwidth, around 10 to 30 bits per minute, which means 0.5 bits per second, which means one movement every two seconds. Not very useful. If you want to have a real-time system, you need to have at least two, three bits per second. And our system can achieve 100 bits per minute, which is uh, beyond the necessary limit in order to become a real-time system. In, in my knowledge, it's one of the fastest systems that is available today uh, as a technology. The question is, how can you use this technology? Uh, first of all, you can use it in healthcare. There are many people out there who are paralyzed, who need to interact with the world, and they need another communication channel because their motor system is defective. So you could use such an interface to control an exoskeleton or to control a, a wheelchair. In other applications, you could think about industrial applications. Instead of the human going into a dangerous place, you would send a robot that is controlled by the human directly. In other applications, and this is going to be probably the first one, you can use this to have fun, just for gaming, entertainment, and so on. And finally, there's another application that I've been thinking about for a while. If we want to go to Mars, we will have to build spaceships in orbit. This is going to be difficult. This is going to require a lot of human power. The problem is humans in space are not very, uh, you know, easy going in the sense that they have these very clumsy suits. They can, their movement is very limited. So imagine that you could have a parallel interface with a robot that you directly control, which brings you tools, which helps you drill and do all kinds of operations. You could massively speed up what you can achieve, right? To summarize, I want to uh, tell you just three home, uh, take home messages. The first one is, do not be afraid that somebody is going to read your mind. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Second, if we want to build useful devices where the brain controls the, um, a computer or any kind of uh, hardware device, you need to put the brain back into the brain-computer interface. The brain is the one you should focus on, not on the device. And finally, uh, we are all witnessing this great explosion of technological prowess. And in the next decades, there will be a lot of progress. But in my opinion, in, in order to have this progress useful for humanity, we need to keep the humans in control. Thank you. <laughs>